Gary, I was, I was looking at, you know, your origins from Buffalo. Is it fair to say that you are a proud card carrying member of the Bills Mafia? <laughs> I've been, uh, yeah, I'm a Bills fan. I am. Yes. I mean, I was, I was really a Bills fan back in the uh, early nineties. And yeah. uh, that's when they went to the Super Bowl and came up empty. But so based on those those four seasons of, of going to the Super Bowl and coming up empty handed, um, in your track record um of, of winning Stanley Cups, what's maybe that degree of difference of of getting to that last stage of the dance and and eventually punching your ticket? A wide right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, so, is it is it is it just is it just the the margins are that thin, and you oh, hope you the get on the right side that, of it? Yeah, the margins are that small, and the momentum shift at the right time is a difference maker. And ironically, you know, when you you win these championships or win a cup or have a chance to to have a big win, you know, it's a, it's a person who you never thought is going to score a goal and make a big play. You know, I mean, you have a roster of, of eighteen plus two. And all of a sudden, somebody you hadn't thought about is a difference maker, you know. So it's it's it seems to go that way. Is is there maybe a lesson in that for coaches? Just in that, you know, it's easy whether you know we're preparing for a game, a season. You put so much of an emphasis on your your star players, but just as a reminder that you know you want to make sure that everybody feels like they're a part of it because it's likely that one of those players that you don't expect is going to be the difference maker. Um, I could say in Detroit, especially, um, I would say the difference maker versus the opponents we had playing in the finals was the depth of our team, the third and fourth line and the five, six defensemen. And sometimes the backup goalie who had to come in, you know, um, but I would say to you, the opposition would have a first line, maybe not a second line, but first line would be is a calibration, the same as ours. But the depth of our team and the ability for the third and fourth line to outplay the oppositions was a difference maker. So the depth of the team definitely was a, a was a winning formula, and to use them, not just have them on the bench with pom poms. I mean, they're there. You know, you have a you have a great quote where you where you talked about, and I believe it was um, when you were inducted into the Elmira uh, Sports Hall of Fame. But you, you talked about how important it was to have a. Um, a wide range of characters, a wide range of skill sets, you know, in, in, in a, as you put a roster together, does that still apply in today's national hockey league? Because it seems like we're, we're seeing a lot more teams maybe focusing on, on, on one style of play, one style of player. Um, but is it still important to have that sort of cross section of skill sets, people, et cetera? Yeah, I told it really is because the game has so many components. Um, you know, the game of hockey, it has a lot of different variations and positional skills. And a team that's successful has players who fill those roles. I mean, they've identified them and the players accept the role and they play it to their fullest. A, a team that's not successful is when you have a collection of players in a locker room. And what I mean by that is you have a guy who is all of a sudden playing third line, but you put him up the first line next game. And then you have a guy who's fourth line up the second line. So you're you're moving your players all around like a Ouija board and it doesn't make sense because there's no difference makers. They're all the same. Yeah. It's a collection of, of players without any identity to help you win. And those teams are not successful. How do you, how does a team identify or how, how does a team or a coach create that team identity? Is that, is that something that could be sort of drawn up or is that a matter of sort of looking at your collection of, of people and, 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 I guess fitting the idea, does the identity fit the people or do you just get the people to fit the identity? Good question. Um, I think you almost have to get the people to fit the identity. Um, you'll have some players who are just off uh, your first two lines, possibly. Okay. They just can't quite get into the top six. And then I'll say, well, for sure, that'd be a great third line player. Well, he doesn't have defensive responsibilities. You know, it doesn't make him happy to chip the puck in without making a backhand flip or, or showing that he has a higher skill level. So that player doesn't play up to that role because he feels it's not his, it's below his abilities. His skill set's higher than that. And you have to have players who accept their roles 
and play the role well, not just, you know, oh, you got to play it. But, you know, play the role well. And that's when you have a good team because players will accept possibly being on the second power play instead of the first. You know, they, they may have to change a line. A lot of coaches will have two players on a line that stay the same for pretty much the season and rotate a third guy. You know, and so I really feel that it's – you can't make a player – uh, responsible. He has to accept it and he has to want to do it. I mean, you can yell at him, show him film, whatever else, but he, he has to desire to play that, to play it well. You can't just go out and go through the motions. Can you, I mean, I just think of some of the teams that you've won championships, like, you know, for example, Brian Trache in Pittsburgh and man, there's just a, a, a list of uh, star players uh, on your Detroit teams that maybe accepted lesser roles um, you know, and in terms of putting the team first, what would a conversation or what might have a conversation look like with some of those players when, when you're trying to, I guess, sell them on, um, you know, the opportunity versus say a demotion? You know, it's not always a coach, um, or coach is they're the difference maker and having a player accept responsibility. I think it's also your leadership. And when you have a good team, you have a great room and the players will have to do things sometimes that they don't like to be a part of that room. I mean, nobody really likes to block shots, you know, it hurts and it's, yeah, you know, but if I want to be part of that room, I got to block a shot. If, they, if I want that, you know, group to accept me is, you know, I'm, I'm all in, I got to do my role. And I think the leadership of a team is, is also a difference maker for you and what the whole team's responsibilities are. You know, in, in I think every example, so again, you won Cups with Pittsburgh, with Detroit, with Chicago. Um, all three of those organizations um, would appear to have had a period where they had, you know, sort of the key people on the bus, but they had to pay their dues, so to speak. It wasn't a, it's not like a light switch went on and they were, they were raising the cup. How, how long did it take the leadership or the leaders to sort of emerge in that role and be in a position where they, they could take a team all the way to a Stanley cup or what was that process like? Um, you know, sometimes people outside of the game feel that, okay, the guy has a C on his Jersey. So therefore he's their leader, you know, the main guy. When actuality, he may not be, he may be just be the best player and he's been given a C because, you know, the city has accepted that and that's a selling point but the actual leader may not have a C on his Jersey. So, yeah. um, you know, and you have to, then there's different strengths of leaders, you know, and there's different leaders who accept, um, you know, different roles. Um, I'll just give you a quick example. When Scotty Bowman and myself joined the Detroit Red Wings, um, I think it was in 94, 95. Um, they had some very good offensive players and, at that time, Steve Eisman was getting a lot of points because he was an excellent offensive player. And they had a, you know, they had a lot of good players around him. Um, and that team could win six, four, seven, five. You know, they they just outgunned you. Yeah. But that team had no chance to win one nothing or two one because that takes a whole different mindset. So we lost in the playoffs that year, and we transitioned some players and brought some other people in. And I, I would say to you probably the, diff the biggest difference maker was Steve Eiserman accepting a role of being more of a, a defensive, uh, maybe not a point getter, but making sure that his defensive responsibilities and his defensive leadership changed, and he did that. And that helped change the team's uh, mentality, along with the players that were brought in. I, I would imagine that it helps um, that – you know, yourself, Scotty Bowman, obviously have that pedigree. You've got Stanley Cups on your resume. You know, when you look back at that time, I mean, just looking at it. So your first year in Detroit, you lose in seven games to San Jose, which was a, I mean, I can remember watching that as a kid. That was a major upset. The second year, you lose in the cup final to New Jersey. Third year, you lose in the conference semifinals to the Avalanche. Um, it would be easy to see where some ownership groups would have, um, you know, brought in a new coaching staff during that period because that team, I think, was was sort of in contention all the way through. When you, you know, now that you're, 
you've stepped away from it. When you look at professional sports as a whole, you know, is there, do we maybe not give coaches the right amount of runway and just understand how hard it is to win? And that if it's, if it's always a case of saying, Hey, if you don't get all the way there, we're just going to find somebody else. How does that affect maybe the culture of a team? I I don't know. I think you have to show results in different ways. Um, And, you know, a team that wins, there's a lot of fate and luck. I mean, I have to be honest with you. You don't just steamroll past teams. You have situations which arise, and sometimes you have an opponent which you might struggle against, and all of a sudden you don't have to play them because they lose, so they're no longer, you know, uh, you know, on your list to play next. Uh, injuries occur during playoffs, which are key. So there's so many factors, really, into a team that wins and the team that loses. Um, it, it's just it's almost like fate. I mean, I remember when we played the Vancouver Canucks and we were down 0-2 playing in their building, Nick Lidstrom has a puck, you know, he has a puck back by his own blue line and pulls it towards his feet and just lifts it up in the air, comes down and bounces in, bang, out of nowhere. I mean, should have never happened and we win four games. So you figure it out. Yeah. Yeah, we've seen that replay a couple times over here in Vancouver. I mean, all of a sudden it's like – how did that happen? I mean, who's behind that divine goal? Is, is there a rivalry in hockey today that would um, maybe have the same level of animosity that would have existed between the Red Wings and Avalanche in the 90s? No, no I don't think so. It, it, the reason why that rivalry was so amazing it wasn't that we just despised each other, but we respected each other as well. But the players were great players. I mean, think about all the Hall of Fame players. Oh, both it's teams. unbelievable. Unbelievable. And it's almost like we knew whoever won that game or that won that seven-game series was probably going to win the Cup. I mean, that's how good it was. And the players and, and the ability to to raise their level, I mean, the, the level of games or level of play in those games was unbelievable yeah it it was and and i don't know you know sometimes it's it's maybe it's easy to look back at um reflect back in 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 previous times and just assume that it was it was better because that's what maybe you grew up with or you know you have those memories but it, it appeared to me then that you know um in that era of hockey that you know you you touched on it with steve eiserman that your best players had to maybe have a bit more sandpaper to their game or maybe commit to um, a more well-rounded game for the team to be successful. Right. I mean, I don't want to, because I'm not an Edmonton coach, but, you know, a few years back you had two players, Dreisaitl, you know, and McDavid who are playing 23 minutes a night and they're winning, you know, they're winning all the accolades for, for the scoring and, you know, for points. But in essence, you need a you need a team. You know what I'm saying? You, yeah. So that that team has to be fortified, and you have to accept you can't play 23 minutes in a, in a playoff game unless you're a defenseman that's you know well versed yeah. as a forward. It's impossible, really. It is. Uh, you might have one game that touches above 20, but the intensity and, and the, the no room and the, the the level of play just completely washes you out. You know, th- that brings up an interesting point. Like, you know, in some of these teams, I mean, obviously, I mean, you talk about the roster you had in Detroit was just, you know, stacked and, you know, you know, Pittsburgh, obviously, and, um, you know, in Chicago, how did you, how did you view ice time? Not just maybe in a single game, but when you looked at it through the span of a season, how would you look at managing that to ensure that players, you know, were able to perform at their best um, come playoff time? Well, you know, I, I, I know the Montgomery for, for Boston, and they had a situation last year, the Bruins, where they already won the President's Trophy, you know, possibly was it two weeks before the season was over? I mean, they had an amazing season. And what happens sometimes, Aaron, is, okay, now that you've won it, you might start giving a couple players, you know, a game off here, a game off there, trying to make sure everybody's freshened up because we're going to be as fresh as possible when that first game comes. And you play an opponent – which had to win seven out of nine, which is already in a playoff mentality. And that first mm-hmm. round is really difficult, really difficult. Because yeah. all of a sudden you have to 
go from a 50 mile an hour, you know, speed zone to a hundred. And, you know, you've been trying to rest your players and make sure everybody's healthy. And the other team has been going at 90. All they have to go is 10 miles, you know, more. And we had to go 50 more. So it's hard that first yeah. round. So going into playoffs, it's, you know, how do you know exactly where you're at mentally and physically, you know, to, to, to balance your players and then the opposition first round, that's the most dangerous round, I think, in, in hockey playoffs. Because you might have an opponent which is absolutely on top of their game. And then after they beat you, they can't win another game. I mean, they topped off. You know, we lost we lost the, the New York Islanders. And that we had the best team at all. That was our third year in Pittsburgh. We should have won a trifecta there. We had a great team. That's right, yeah. And we played the Islanders. And, you know, they didn't make you mad. Sorry we hit you, sir. You know, we didn't mean to make that save. Uh, you know, so there's no animosity to raise your level. Bang, you lose in a seven-game series. A guy scores a goal and never plays again, and you're out. And they can't even play next game because they, the, they already had the bus trip, you know, for the biggest wins they've had. They play the next opponent. They had nothing left. Yeah. Which was Montreal at that time. That's right. That's right. Well, you know, it's it's funny and I it, it, and timely because just this morning I was I sent a text to a, a good friend of mine who's out in Toronto, a big Leafs fan. And I said, "Hey, like, does this Matthews get to seventy? And his response was, "He's like, they just need to sit him down. It would send the right message to the team, rest him up." And I was like, "I don't know if it's that simple um, to bring him up, but I, I mean, it, it just I think it just goes to show that." Um, and I think sometimes it gets lost is that, you know, just the amount of, and I, and I'm sure with the benefit of hindsight, like the amount of critical decisions that get made throughout a season by a coach, like it's not just about line matchups. Like there's all these, you know, you're constantly at a fork in the road and those forks are, you know, are, are going to define, um, ultimately how your team performs and how you put it together. Um, well, you know, Aaron, that's a good point. I, I, I'd say to you then just. Your most successful coaches in all sports, they have a good read on your team. I mean, your team is almost like an amoeba during the season. It just changes shape. It changes yeah. form. You have a high. You have a low. You have somebody who's out, somebody who's in. You know, it, it's a long grind. It's really – and then you have to play a possible, you know, seven-game series four times. That's incredible. That's why I think it's the most difficult sporting event to, to win – is because of that grind and mentality and physicality and you're done. Well, so let's frame it this way. You, you began your coaching career at Elmira college. Yep. I believe you were four years removed from, from graduating from playing hockey at Ithaca. Mm -hmm. So young man, you know, I, again, just doing research, my first thought was, gosh, like you, you just got thrown in the deep end um, knowing what a grind it is, knowing how important it is to have a pulse on your team and that it's a, essentially a living, breathing organism. What would you go back and tell Barry Smith, uh, a young Barry Smith in 1976 before embarking on his first head coaching role with it? Is it fair to say you didn't have any assistant coaching experience at that point? Like you literally just jumped into it. Um, yeah, I was unprepared totally, Aaron. And my younger brother, David, was uh, one of the captains of the team. Oh, and they wow. had done they had done quite well um, before I came in, but the coach had left to take a different job. So I was a young coach coming from a prep school in, in Pitts or Philadelphia, a Germantown Academy, and you know I thought I had all the answers, and I was going to go gung ho. And, and my, I was coaching my brother; it was fantastic. Well, I was totally unprepared, did a poor job. The team didn't play nearly as well as they should have, and I was lucky to be able to stay for a second year. And that summer. Ironically, I had a chance to uh, join the um, Concordia University out of Quebec. And yep. they had a group that went over to Russia to study at the Moscow Sport and Culture. And so I went over with that group. And Tarasov at that time was the person who did the course. They had hockey. They had gymnastics. They had tra uh, track and field. They had a bunch of different uh, sports that you could take. Well, I was in the hockey group. And... That was an eye opener for me, his fundamentals and the way they worked off the ice and and, you know, the cadence of practices they had and, and what the most important facets were. So I was lucky. I met Ron Mason at the time, who was coach of Michigan State, Teddy Sater. I had a, quite a few, a lot of good high end people there. And I took almost all that that I learned from the Russian group 
back to Elmira College, and the poor players, I mean, God bless them for putting up with it. They they did a rushing off ice, and they had them uh, had them running hills and everything else. So, and I used all the fundamentals that he taught, and I realized at that time, it, which helped me all along, that if you're strong in your fundamentals in your execution, and it's your players, you know, are all together. Um, you know, his players were all together. It's tough practices they had that you can have success. And my Elmira guys were great. They put up with me. They, we had a great four year run at that point in time. And it was a difference maker, you know, and when, and you use everybody. I've got a, a zillion questions regarding that experience, but I, I just want to pause because I mean, I look at the timing of that, you know, I'm assuming the summer of 1977, um, not far removed from the cold war. There's no internet yet. I mean, right. just, just that, just to take on that experience, like, was there a, a how much thought went into that? That what you know, whether it's from your 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 safety and and just what the conditions, how were you accepted? I mean, that must have just been wild. Uh, we were accepted quite well. Um, it was mostly a Canadian group because obviously it was out of Concordia, um, and the the players that we did work with on the Russian national team, one or two of them could speak some English, obviously, a couple, you know, and. We had interpreters with us, and it was it was quite open, really. It was. I thought Tarasov was great, and all his his coaches that were working with us and on the ice practices. I thought it was it was extremely good. And then the following year, I believe it was the following year, I went to Sweden, and we with the same group from Concordia, and we studied at the school. Um, it was Busan University, which was outside of Stockholm. Yeah. And they had some great Swedish coaches, Arnie Stromberg, and some people were working with us. And I met Hasse Westbrook at the same time. And I, I, I befriended those guys. That was much easier because English for them was a second language. You know, that was quite yeah. easy for the Swedes. And once again, you learn some more techniques about European hockey that you could bring back to North America to try to give your team a leg up, you know, on the opposition, you know, practice methodology, um, you know, I, when I went over to Sweden another time to work in the summer with some, some teams in, in the Stockholm area, I had a chance to sort of bring back the left wing lock or, or left side back. And that helped our Detroit team stabilize, you know, a defensive posture. And that was just working with them and, and understanding that there was different ways to play the game. I mean, a Russian coach, if Tarasov watched our game today, he'd say, what is that? There's no puck possession. You know, it's just go yeah. chase, go fast, go quick, go fast. And his philosophy was, you know, under control, have it, keep it, you know, support it. If you don't have a shot, you don't take it. You know, the Russians were never, you never outshot them. I mean, you always outshot them because they only shot when they were going to score a goal. Yeah. What, you know, so at this point, it's again, four years removed from you know, the 72 series. What, what was the motivation for them to even host or entertain the idea of, of sharing? I mean, again, I, I think I would look back and think that it was evident to everybody. So it must have been, or at least everybody over here, so it must have been evident to them that the way they were playing the game was vastly different um, than how it was being played in, in North America. What, what do you think their motivation was to say, hey, we're going to bring folks like yourself over and share some of our trade secrets? Um, there must've been a financial package, you know what I'm saying? Uh, yeah. we had to pay for the education through Concordia. So obviously it was financial. Um, I do know that they asked some of the coaches, I think we had the Bennett brothers at that time. We had some high end guys who had played, uh, with us in the group. Ron Mason was a very respected coach yeah. and they gave, they gave also things back to the Russian group, you know, in their, in their conversations and discussions. I see. Yeah. So there was sharing ideas, but um, I sure as hell didn't raise my hand. <laughs> How did Anatoly Tarasov define the fundamentals of the game? Um, well, I think he had to find a way that his team could be competitive versus the teams that were superior in, in tactics. And, you know, his, his philosophy was they were the best condition team, okay, and he understood what was necessary for hockey. Um they were able to support the puck and keep it and, 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 and even go back and regroup if you can recall. Yeah. And, 
you know, when they shot, it was for to score a goal, empty net or pass across or whatever it was. And they didn't have the mentality of coming down, just bombing the, you know, bombing the goalie. Yeah. Um, you know, if I could give you an analogy uh, of a North American practice and a European practice, if I put a bucket of pucks on the ice here in North America and turn my back and had a coffee with you, as I turned my back and it was talking to you, I'd hear bang, 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 bang. And then as the players just taking slap shots off the boards and glass and just pounding that puck, I drop yeah. a bucket of pucks over in Europe and you hear ch -ch 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 -ch. just the passing no way. That's so interesting. Well, it's, it, they have the soccer mentality. You know, we're going to we're going to handle this thing or we're going to make it look good. You know, we have technique. I think the soccer mentality is, is very big in Europe. So, you know, you go over to Russia. You mentioned you go to Sweden. You would eventually, after Elmira, you'd go spend three years in Sweden. You've coached in Russia. Back then, as a young coach looking to, you know, expand your knowledge, why was it obvious to you to maybe look across the pond versus, you know, coaches or, or you know, the information you could have gathered close to home? Um, I'd say this to you, and you could, you know, possibly interview some other younger coaches today, but back then, the information, um, we didn't have the internet, you know what I'm saying? We, we didn't go on and watch yeah. YouTube. You had to go out and find your information, or luckily enough to have somebody come to you to share information. Yeah. So we had to go find information, and that's what we did. That's what I did. Um, and I, I was lucky enough to befriend Scotty Bowman because I was a Buffalonian. And I met him when I was coaching in Sweden. Um, he called me and heard that I was coaching there. He had a couple of questions about a draft. He was going to draft a couple of Swedes. It was Kali Johansson, Mikkel Anderson, you know. And he was asking me about, you know, what do I think about him, whatever else. And he sort of befriended me at that time because we shared ideas and talked about different things that I saw overseas. And Scotty loved the Russian hockey, if you remember. I mean, he had coached yeah. against it. He had high respect for it. So he was very, I mean, he was a very inquisitive coach that wanted to have information from everywhere. I think that's what made Scotty great. You know, he had not just one train of thought. He, he took everything in. So I befriended him then, and I was lucky enough to be called in to work for the Buffalo Sabres uh, when they fired Sean Feld when I was working in Europe. But he called was that mid-season? I think it was late season. I would say, I want to say to you February. Got it. Okay. Yeah. How, how was that? I mean, I would just, I mean, I look at the trajectory on, on paper today. I mean, just to go from, you know, division three, uh, NCAA school, three years in Europe, and then boom, you're in the NHL. Like, can you remember? I mean, I just think like that flight from Sweden to, to Buffalo, um, were, were you nervous? Like, did you feel like you were ready for that, that stage of your career? Um, you don't know until you're there, what you think you're yeah. ready for. And no, I really wasn't ready for it because I didn't have an NHL background and didn't even socialize, you know, with many NHL players at that time. So I was sort of missing some of the steps into, you know, the, how you, the etiquette of being around professional players. So I came in just full of piss and vinegar and I was yeah. lucky it was a young team at that time and, and we had fun with the guys. So it, it was okay. But I remember I learned early on, uh, we were playing the Philadelphia Flyers first game and, um, you know, we scored a goal in, in, right away in the first five minutes of the game. And you know how hockey players are, they all high five or whatever else and they're, they're very superstitious. Yeah. So if they high five you for the first goal, they're sure as hell going to high five you for the second, third goal, right? Yeah. So I think we scored two goals in the first period, and I got high five because I was standing there. They had no, nothing else to do with me, so they gave me a slap, and I get called in between periods, and I'm pretty high because we're up two nothing. And you know, Scotty says to me, "What are you doing?" And I'm, I, what do you mean? He goes, "What are you doing?" And I, I'm watching the game. Yeah. He goes, "You know, if I wanted to bring in a, <laughs> a cheerleader." I would have brought some pom poms, giving you a skirt. Now act like a coach, and I don't want to see it, you know. So now, now the no. second period we score again, and I got to bend down, and touch my feet because I make sure the guys don't see me because I can't do it again. So I learned early on. He, you know, he taught me that the players are the players, the coaches are coaches, and there's a separation. You know, keep the respect, but you're not one of them. So 
And that was that was a learning process. How important is it for young coaches, just in terms of your your demeanor, uh, your tone, etc., just how you carry yourself? How, how intentional does that need to be? I think you have to be real. I mean, yeah. And everybody has a different personality, Aaron. So I think you have to be real. And, um, you know, the coaches, most of these guys have had so many different coaches. You think about it. They've had, you know, junior. They've had college coaches. They may have had minor coaches. So they've had so many personalities that I don't think anything throws them off. That's why they're great pros. Um, You know, they can focus on the game and they'll listen to the coach and take the points they want to use and, you know, close off their mind for some other points. And they have to, they hear it all. They see it all. Um, that's why they're great pros and still go out and perform. I mean, I have a lot of respect for them. I really do. You mentioned that Scotty Bowman um, wanted to take in all the information. And I, man, I can just imagine that at that stage, like just given his career out of Montreal, when you get a call from, from him as a young coach, that must have been a real thrill. But as you progressed in your careers together, he's got all this information. You certainly are bringing in a bunch of information. How did you decide what was going to be implemented with your team and what might get parked for later or just maybe just didn't fit, period? Well, there's one stepping stone that um, I've missed, and that was in Pittsburgh, when I first went into Pittsburgh after working with Scotty in Buffalo, uh, Bob Johnson was the coach. And I don't know if you remember Bob. Um, Bob had coached at the University of Wisconsin for a long time. We called him Badger Bob. Yeah. Then he went to coach in Calgary. Um, and he was probably the most optimistic coach I've ever had a chance to be with. I mean, he just loved the game. He just, you know, had to get his hands together and say, we got a big one today. We got a good practice. And he was just a really amazing, upbeat person. And I think his personality fit that team. And he got along with all the guys tremendously. You know, I mean, he was. Just would would he have been a real outlier at, at that at, at that time of I, not just in hockey but in sports and how coaches operated? Bob Johnson, you mean? Yeah. Possibly. I mean, he was a very successful coach in college, obviously, and he had he knew the yeah. fundamentals of the game, loved the power play. Loved talking power play, loved doing the power play. And the guys, I mean, you'd have to have a smile on your face because he did. You know, he'd walk in and let's go, boys. This is a great day for hockey. And and I remember um in the in the finals versus Minnesota, you know, I think it was game six. And, you know, Bob, he had a really good handle on the on, on the game itself, and he was just I always just loved to be in behind the bench. I mean, he just just loved to be loved to be around the game. He'd be there twenty four seven if he could. And we're up six nothing after two periods, and we may win the cup if we can win the third period. So he says to me, and I think Rick Hio is next to me, and he goes, um, "What do we say? What do you mean? Like between periods? Yeah." And I'm thinking to myself, "Has anybody lost a six goal lead? Like you're not even happy. You're panicked, and you're up by six. Yeah. And you're panicked because you think, can we screw this up? You know, you, you, your mindset's the other way. I mean, what are we going to say to the guys? I, I I, don't know what to say. I mean, I'm not going to go in there. I mean, <laughs> what are you going to do here? So he goes, we've got to say something. So you know how the, the, uh, the trainers come out and say, you know, you got to go in there. And I think, I, I can't remember the, the verbiage, but I think Bob Johnson said something like, whatever you're doing, just keep doing it. You know, let's go. Bang. Just and that go. simple. You know, what are you going to say? It, is there something to be said for that, that, you know, part of the role of the coaches, I mean, I think it's so easy as, especially as young coaches, you feel like you got to get it all out and you got to communicate everything. Is there something to be said just for being subtle and, and maybe, maybe few words can, you know, not just in, you know, game six of the Stanley Cup final when the cup's on the line, but just in general that, um, you know, that's part of the art of coaching is knowing when to say more and when to say less. Absolutely. We all have a tendency to overcoach. We all have a tendency to, you know, just go over every single point. Because if you don't cover it, you know, you're going to lose because you didn't cover that point. Meanwhile, the players can only process so much. And don't forget, I mean, I don't know if it was longer at that point in time. It's 18 minutes now, you know, from the time that you leave the ice to the time you have to go back in the puck drop. Guys have to get their stuff ready. They're, they're going in, they, you know, go to the john, they do this, they do that. 
and you can't come out and give them more than one or two points that are that are important because they can't pick up on it. And I found also too that sometimes we do over video. You know, well, this video, that's a great thing. Video, video is a great thing. Video, you know, we're gonna teach them, we're gonna show them. Well, actually, video is showing something which has already occurred, if you think about it. All right, so yeah. you're showing something from the past. In the game of hockey, there's almost nothing which happens identical to the situation prior to. That's there's a different slant, different angle to it, you know, different speed. Think about yeah. it. What identically is going to happen again? Almost nothing identically is going to happen again. And then the other part that we don't realize by video is I'm a player, okay, I'm five foot nine, whatever it is, and my vision point of that, what I'm looking at is right here, and that's what I see, okay? That's my scanning, that's my vision, that's what I have to process. And now yeah. I have to react to what I see. Meanwhile, what's the video? The video is up here giving you an overview of what was there. Well, I'm not up there to see that. So I can look at it and say, okay, maybe I can get a better feel for it. But this is what I'm trying to teach now is, okay, that's what's happened. But if we're going to be successful, let's do it now. Let's do it in the moment. And then, you know, reinforce what you're doing right or wrong. Because if you don't do it in the moment, you watch it what's past doesn't mean you're going to do it again successfully when it happens again. You're not going to do it. So I guess maybe with the analogy be like, you know, it would be easy to in today's hockey where you could have, you could develop a player who is a whiz at watching video and pointing out what's right, wrong, or what should be done. But that is in, very different than in the it moment. Doesn't mean he's going to do it in the game thing. because what he sees and what he processes will not be the same. And it's not the same identical situation. It gives you an overview. Oh, yeah. Okay. 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 Oh, yeah. Now you have a little bit of mindset. What could have happened? What should have happened? But when you're happening in that moment of the game, you only have microseconds, you know, to process and then react. So with that being said, how much video, if any, would you have watched with the Pittsburgh Penguins that first year? Hardly all. Not much. And not even much in Detroit, really. Really? No. And, and was that intentional? Was there a belief that maybe it just wasn't effective? Or, or, or what was the thought process? You know, particularly in Detroit, where I think video would have become a, a bit more prominent at that time. Yeah, it was a bit more, but possibly because we weren't great on it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Dave Lewis, myself, and, and then when Joey Coaster came in, or Mike Kruzelinski, I mean, we weren't high-tech whizzes to be able to use computers, whatever. And then when I went back in to help out with Chicago uh, behind the bench, and some of the meetings, I mean, today's guys, that computer is like a second, you know, it's like a second arm. Yeah. 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 I thought I was an IBM I thought, instead of the coach's office. <laughs> um, you know, just sticking with Pittsburgh, fair to say at that stage of your career, you probably hadn't coached a, a player um, with the level of talent of Mario Lemieux. And I mean, you, obviously not just him, you've got – I mean, again, I, I just don't know if we'll ever see teams in the salary cap era um, have that amount of world-class early players on one roster. But you've got Ron Francis, Jeremy Jagger, and um, Paul well, I'd, say to, I'd say to you probably what helped turn that team around was the trade they made with Hartford at that time, and Ron Francis came through the door. Really, yeah. yeah Ron Francis came in, Ulf Samuelson, who was a warrior. Uh, Grant Jennings, who was a, you know, a 5'6 D-man. And they came in. And to have Ron Francis go from being the number one guy of, you know, everything in Hartford to being a number two center behind Mario. And then you have a, a third, you know, third line center Trotsier. That's not yeah. bad. It's decent. Yeah. Yeah. Three Hall of Famers. I mean, so that helped turn the game around. And Ron Francis on the ice was like having a coach. And you don't coach Mario. I mean, you just put him on the ice. You don't, have, you don't coach. Well, you don't that, coach that, that was going to be my question. I mean, I look at, um, and you can go on YouTube now, and I would encourage, you know, depending on how, how old you are, if you haven't gone on YouTube and looked at Mary Lemieux highlights, and this is to not take anything away from any of the generational players we have today. Uh, gosh, I can't think. The only thing I would really compare it to is when Shaquille O'Neal came into the NBA and he just dominated in such a different way. And it kind of seemed like with Mario that he was just so big, so strong, so skilled. It just, it looked different. 
from a coaching perspective, did did you have to learn that, hey, we just got to let this guy run and kind of stay out of his way? Or, or did you, did you kind of know that going in? Um, I think you've, you knew it was way above your level of thought. I mean, so yeah. these great players, uh, their ability to perceive their perception ability and the reaction ability and their anticipation and their hockey sense is off the charts. It's like, if you're a, a high level football quarterback, yeah, I mean, you, your vision is totally different than yours and mine ability to see something down the field, 30 yards with hands going in front of your face and guys coming at you and whatever else. I mean, so you're, you're wired differently. And, and Mario was definitely an amazing, amazing athlete. And don't forget most of his career that even when I was there for the three seasons, he was never healthy a hundred percent. Think about yeah. that. How did you, I mean, you talked about that evolution maybe on the leadership side with like, say, Steve Eisman, where he had to change his role. I, I don't get the sense that Mario ever changed his role, but did you observe just in terms of the leadership and, and maybe what he may have, how he leaned on, say, a Ron Francis or a Brian Trache or, you know, just the maturity of, of, of him maybe having to get to a certain point so that team could, could um, realize its potential? It's almost like the great players, they know the moment they're supposed to step up. You know, they, they know that when they rise above the rest with some amazing play or ability to take their play up to a, a level that can't be matched by the op- opposition. I mean, that was Mario. And that's pretty much Stevie, all those guys that, you know, they would, at, at the right moment, they would just rise above and just take it, you know. And, and that's just something which you don't teach. You know, it's it's – you're either born with it or you don't have it. I mean, that's, that's the difference makers. So after that first year, you, you, you capture the cup against uh, Minnesota and, and sadly Bob is diagnosed with a brain tumor. Um, I believe in that off season or or early in the next season. During the summer we had team USA at the time. I think it. it was the, yeah. So, you know, everybody's aware and this didn't occur to me until just doing some research for this conversation, but you know, Scotty Bowman comes in the following year, you guys beat Chicago for the cup and and repeat, but very unique circumstance that, I mean, again, I I didn't know either gentleman. I, I, my sense is that Badger Bob and Scotty Bowman are very different on the personality scale. Um, but you're kind of there as a conduit. I just, I just look back at it like, man, like having, you know, the fact that Pittsburgh had a coach that had coached with Scotty that had been there with Bob and could maybe, would it, I would just sense that there might have been some massaging to sort of bridge maybe some gaps or build some relationships on the fly quickly with some obviously very well-established players to make that, you know, um, make that cocktail work. Yeah, um, I, I would say what, what helped the transition, Scotty was actually with the team the previous year, I think, in player evaluation. So he was in a, yeah, so he was in an office position, but I know that Bob would talk to him. So he had a handle on the team. Um, we, we had Rick Keel, uh, Rick Patterson, um, who were the assistants who helped the transition because they were there for the next year as well as myself. And yeah. then the players were pretty much all there as well. You know what I'm saying? So it was the same group that won. Um, and Mario was still our leader, obviously. And Ronnie yeah. Francis was still in the room. I mean, so there was an easier transition coming in uh, when Scotty came in. And Scotty is, you know, he has a great handle on players and their abilities and who to put in at the right moment. And on the bench, he's probably the best coach, you know, the best bench coach ever of his ability to sense the game, who to put out there at the right moment, how to change the flow. You know, that's his thing. And, and was that all, I mean, I, I mean, that's been said about Scotty um, extensively. Was that all, was that something that was maybe he prepared for and say the pre-scout or he kind of had mapped out or was that very much just gut feel in the moment having a sense for, I would say gut feel in the moment, having the sense, and also understanding if he puts you on the ice, he knew what your abilities were to put you in a place that you're going to be successful. You know, not to put you on the ice to have a turnover. 
or use the right guy at the right time. And, you know, he was big on the details of the game as well. You know, line changes, um, you know, how you come yeah. out and off the ice. So, and they're all very important in the playoffs, as you know, because the intensity goes up. Line changes are really important to be, you know, at the right time, the right moment, not leaving an opposition without number rush or where you put the puck. So puck management as well. As a staff, would you have had a, I don't want to compare it to being poker players, but would you sort of have had a book on the tells of other coaches in the league and, you know, how they would manage their bench and how you might anticipate that and, and get favorable matchups? I would say it's a whole different game now. And, you know, in that era, and maybe even before me, when I was before, before the um, 90s or 80s, um, you know, the coaches all had their own personalities, if you remember. I mean, each guy had a personality, and, and the yeah. team had that personality, and you didn't – players stayed in one team almost all the time. If you're a Boston Bruin, you yeah. hated the Montreal Canadiens. You stayed with the same group. You didn't – you know. And, um, you know, that was sort of a special thing. And, and coaches, we shared information a little bit more than they share now. Um, I, I feel bad for our really? young coaches. Yeah, yeah. Because everybody has, you know, their own book they want to keep tight to their chest. There was a lot of different ways to play back then. And if you see the game today, uh, you show me another power play that's not set up in a 1-3-1 that doesn't move from that power play to something else. But it's a basic setup. That's a great point. And it's, it's part of that. I mean, you, you touched on it earlier when you talked about, you know, going to Russia, that there was maybe it was sort of a give and take where they were opening up their doors. But at the same time, they were taking in information was part of that because there was no YouTube. There wasn't as many clinics, et cetera, that coaches had to give a little to get something back. Absolutely. And they didn't mind sharing. It's almost like they wanted to expand the game. And and now we're all worried about our own, you know, our own little team and our own little world. And I, I find that's what I've been doing the last two seasons is going out and working with the amateur, you know, the junior teams and the, uh, you know, whether it's the BCHL, USHL or organizations or working with academies it's fun to go out and work the field because they can't get information coming to them. They have to go out to a special session to get it, you know? Yeah. And if you watch on YouTube, you're seeing a highlight. You're seeing a lot of individual skill things, you know, individual, you go around this, you have an edge control, you have a balance position, your stride position, your stick. Well, the game is played collectively and that's why we have to get more information to the coaches so we can teach collectively. You know, the hockey sense and hockey, hockey IQ, I think, has gone down a bit because of, you know, kids not playing in the streets, not playing in the ponds, not playing in the backyards. Um, you know, we don't have a lot of creative play. We're on computers, we're on iPads, we're on whatever. And kids can practice. They look good in practice. But you put them in a game, you wonder, why did he go there? Or why did he do that? Or why didn't he? Well, as you say that, I mean, you talk about how, you know, you didn't watch – much video, if at all, in, in Pittsburgh and Detroit. I mean, I, I bet you there's U11 teams out there where the kids are watching, you know, several hours of video a week. If, if you were coaching, um, if you became the head coach of the Glendale U11 team next year, would, would video have any place in your program? Um, perhaps a part to show a, a situation so they understand what the situation was so you can actually see it. But I find for the actual teaching moment, Aaron, that we have to do it. Yeah. And, and you have to do it with repetition. And, and, I, and I'm, I'm almost teaching now multiple pucks in practice and in drill. So you go from one side to react to the other side to react and then execution. And what is your execution? Can you describe That's that in more detail? Yeah, so if you're watching the game, okay, yeah, um, just give me two teams and I'll just sort of talk. Who, which two teams you want? Uh, Canucks and Vegas. Okay, so Vancouver's attacking on an entry. They yeah. chip the puck in to chase it, which is a very safe way to get in, right? You're not going to have a turnover. So it's a chip and chase. Yeah. So that moment the puck is chipped, there's no possession. Nobody has the puck on their stick. There's no possession. 50, so that's 50. called a no possession situation. That's a race. Yeah. So if I'm the number one guy who chipped it and go chase it, I'm okay. I don't have to read anything besides where's that guy going so I have to track him down and get that puck or get it first. That's all yeah. I have to see. Pursuing if, the puck. Yeah. And if you are the person going back to get it, your concern is to get that puck and maybe check off to see what I'm going to do with it if I do get it. So there's a race. Yeah. Now, if you're the number two player – 
on the offensive team, on the Canuck team that's shifted in, you have to decide, is Aaron going to win that race? Or if he's not, I better be in the defensive side and be a little higher. And if he's yeah. going to win it, I'm going to break and be an offensive offensive play right away, a bang-bang play. And if it's a 50-50, which means both players are going to have contact, I'm going to come in as quick as I can to be what they call second quick, you know, to help you in the battle. Yeah. By having two of us, we should outnumber, you know, the opposition to get that puck back. So, and then it happens again because the puck goes to the other side of the ice, behind it and that. So now there's another race for the puck and another read and another react and another execution. Then it goes up the boards again. So in an NHL game, you know, which is the highest skill level we have here, um, I would say to you the average number of races per 40 to 45 second shift is 10 to 12 races. That's 10 to 12 times in that shift there was no possession. And it would be would it be fair to say that in those moments there's there's eight players on the ice that have to make a, a pretty critical decision. I'd say almost 10 at some point because the puck's going to move that that much, 10, yes. Yeah. You know what just so I mean I think what you just described was was very simple Barry, but I would say in a world where the term hockey IQ, hockey sense gets thrown around a ton it, it probably is very rarely defined clearly, and I think what you just described there in that situation was was crystal clear. And I and I think probably a hopefully a conversation that a lot of our listeners can take back to their teams. And I would say young players just to hear it defined that way, and probably does them a great service to have a better understanding of you know what hockey what coaches mean when they say hockey sense or hockey IQ. Yeah. So you take our coaching um, in North America, and we've coached certain ways. You have and, and you as a coach of a team, you really are in the woods because you have you have power play, you have penalty kill, you may have neutral zone, you have position play, you have a face-off situation, you have personalities you have to worry about, you know, is Aaron going to like Barry to play with him on the same line? Or is he going to be upset if I take him off that line? I got this parent screaming at me about ice time, you know. So you have all this noise around you as a coach. And as I say, you're in the woods because you can't see a tree. For, I mean – Everything is there. You have a lot of things in your way, obstacles. And if a person comes in to work with you, I don't have a personality to worry about. I don't have to, a game to win. You know what I'm saying? I came in to help you run a better practice. And we've been doing the same type of practices besides maybe now we have small ice games um, an awful lot in North America. And, you know, what can we do to produce a better player? That's the key. Yeah. I mean, we're producing players only by numbers. You have so many numbers that somebody's about to pop out of that pile and become a good player. But what can we do to produce better players? So that's why I'm taking this, this slant and trying to improve all the time with it is how can I make Aaron a better player in situations? All right. Now, if I was to ask you, I'll just, I'll just give you a test right now. So if I was to ask, it might be you, a hopeless case, by the way, Barry. Oh, yeah. I wouldn't invest too much oh, time yeah. in me. You know, all right. <laughs> if I was to ask you what you can improve, okay? Yeah. So you have, give me an age of a player. You want to take an older player, like 18, 19? Let's go 14. Okay, 14. Okay. First question You have three different levels of improvement minimal, which is 0 to 15% improvement. Moderate, which is 15 to 30 percent improvement, and then maximal was 30 to 50 percent improvement. So those are your levels of improvement, and you have your 15 year old player. Is that correct? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Hockey sense and hockey IQ. All right. We're going to do practices now, and we have a season. What percentage of those three things, those minimal, moderate, max, can you help with a 15 year old? Moderate. Yeah, I would say moderate as well, because if he was 19 or 20, it may go to minimal because he's pretty much wired into his game. And we're still developing this game at 15. So would it be fair to say that um, the ability to influence a player's hockey IQ diminishes over time and that you got to plant those seeds while they're young? For, for sure, because sometimes you either have it or you don't, but we're trying to improve it. You know what I'm saying? You do have a yeah. level... Of, of understanding the game. So we want to improve your level of understanding. So well, how can we do it? Well, 
we can help you by replicating the game in practice. So here's what we're doing in North America. We practice pretty and play ugly. Okay, that's fair. You know what I'm saying? We practice yeah. clean. Everything's clean and tick, tick, and go around. But when the game starts, it's ugly. It's chaos. Yeah. All right, so if we want to improve our game, let's practice chaos so we're better in chaos of reading what's happening and either possessing the puck or getting the puck back or making a play than if we practice situations which don't happen. So if there's 10 to 12 races in an NHL game and the puck is on the boards or along the wall over 60% of the time, what do you think you should practice? So I, I, I love um, going out and watching practice now, and I have more time to do that than you know, maybe I've ever had. But one thing that I've observed is you talk about practice and chaos. Coaches love things to be perfect. And you know, certainly we've seen a lot more small area games and I think sort of degrees of chaos that have been introduced in practice. But one thing I've noticed that as soon as something goes off script a little bit, whistle goes, everybody comes in, coach talks, they go back to the drill, you know, sure shit, another, something goes off script a little bit, they bring them back in and they talk. When you talk about chaos as a coach, do you have any recommendations or frameworks to say, this is when you would insert yourself and correct versus let it play out and let the player learn by doing? Uh, good point. I'd say to you, Here's, here's your facets of improving um, hockey reads, okay? So the first thing is, what do you see? Yeah. I, it, there's different words. In, in soccer, they call it scanning. You know, what do you see? So my head's up. I see something. But if I'm taught what to look for immediately, I'm going to make a quicker vision perception, in, right, than if I just look and say, what's that? Okay. So if I understand what I'm looking for, I'll have a chance to process it faster, correctly. Okay, so, we, so here's your step one. Is vision, what are you looking for? Okay, and then how fast do I process that? Now, once I process it, I can react to it. Does that make sense to you? It, it does. And I would just, but like, as soon as you say that, like the one thing that pops to mind, would, would we improve the level of coaching dramatically? If, if we enforce to coaches that the first question they have to ask a player is not to jump in and correct them right away, but just to ask, what did you see? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And, and then you have to teach them, what are you looking for? Are you looking for sticks? Are you looking for space? Yeah. No, are, you, are you watching the race? You know, are you and I 50-50 in a race? Is there, going to be, is there contact, no contact? So the quicker I learn what to look for, I can process it faster. And react quicker. And then the third, the third part of your formula for success is going to be, what is your, what is your execution? You know, what is your fundamental execution? If we go in to have a, you know, physicality, do I go through your arms or am, am I on your back? You know what I'm saying? Is my stick off the ice or is my stick on the ice? You know, if I gab, have a puck, what is my passing position? You know, where's my hips at? How do I quickly make that play? So, you have a couple of different things. You have to read the play, react to it, and then execute whatever you're going to do. And if the board, if the game is played on the boards over 60% of the time, let's work against the wall, understanding how to use angles, understanding how yeah. to keep the puck, win a puck, you know, indirect passes. So I think what we can do is understand what we're what's happening in the game, and then try to improve that in practice. And that's why multiple pucks are important, because you have to go from side to side to up to down. And today's game is so fast that, in essence, you don't have left wing, center, right wing anymore. You have one, two, three. So, yes, that man, I... So just two quick thoughts on that. The one thing I, I think... What you just described there, just going back to your comment, which makes all kind even more sense now, but when we show players video, we show them that top-down view, and we're basically giving them information that's going to be completely irrelevant in the moment because they don't even have the ability to process any of that. And the information, when you talk about sticks and hands, um, that information probably isn't evident on the video. 
um, which is the stuff that really matters. Um, and when you talk about the multiple pucks, that's really just a, a structure that in, that forces players to make decisions in practice versus going on the whiteboard and saying you're going to turn around this pile on and you know you're going to create a really controlled environment. It's just is, is right. That- so say you're in your defensive zone, okay? You're playing. Yeah. You're, you're going back into the defensive zone. So as you go back in the defensive zone, you're processing. Where am I supposed to go? I'm a forward. Am I supposed to go lower? Am I supposed to go high? You know, where am I first guy back, second guy back, third guy back? And then once you go there, what are you processing? You know, do I have awareness of what's behind me? Am I going to go in to help out for the battle? It's 50 50 to be a number two quick. And now all of a sudden the puck changes sides. Well, I have to change my position because my, my role has changed now. And then you can have a third puck and change it back again to another spot. So in essence, I've reacted once reacted twice and now I've reacted a third time and and within 10 seconds of each puck that's 30 seconds so I know that you've been you know you've been traveling around and working with um teams in you know the USHL BCHL prep school etc how early do you think that you can start introducing maybe not having three switches but just this idea of multiple pucks or allowing players to make decisions years old yeah because in essence, you know, because you start shaving doesn't mean you have hockey sense, you know, or, or <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, now you have it because look at, you know, you have a beard now. So obviously you have hockey. No, it, it doesn't have an age. Yeah, it doesn't have an age. And it, it could be soccer sense. It could be basketball sense. You know what I'm saying? Whatever the sports sense is. And I was fortunate when you talk about those cup teams. The hockey IQ in those teams was outstanding. And we just took it for granted, you know. And then all of a sudden you work with a team that's not – they might have skill, but they're not mentally gifted like these guys were. It's a whole new game. Were were you – was it – I mean, was hockey sense – you know, when you were in the coach's office with the Detroit Red Wings, was hockey sense a terminology that came up? Or were you being proactive in in trying to develop or teach it in practice? Um. We did situations in practice for sure. Uh, I'll say that. And then we practiced our our fundamentals. And I'm still a big believer in, in doing your fundamentals correctly, right? Yeah. If you do fundamentals correctly, you're going to be a good player in, in whatever situation you have to use that fundamental. So we did that well. And I just think the guys we had were, they wanted to be, they wanted to have practices which tested them. They wanted to have high, you know, high speed practices. They wanted to have, they just like to be tested. I know if I if, if I ran a bad practice, I'd take a look. Guys riding the bike saying that was a shitty practice. Got to ride the bike now because we're going to get our legs going. You know, so I was, Got it's it. like, okay, yeah. I better pick this one up. When so when you go and work with teams now, um, how do you evaluate where their level of say hockey sense, hockey IQ might be? Is that something that you kind of have to observe on the fly? when you first step on the ice with them, or is that something that you might sort of, you know, effectively do a pre-scout to sort of gauge wh- where they're at? No, I the can, game? I you can tell on the ice pretty much, you know, what are the tells? Um, you know, you, you know, you see at first is offensive, offensive play. You can look at that first and then second, I'll tell you the other spot. So ironically, if I have you uh, take a pass, win and shoot, you're going to look good because you skated well and had a good shot, correct? I mean, that's basically all to look at because you caught a pass, you went in, you took a shot, you either shoot the puck well, good, you know, good angle, had some heat on it, you know, whatever. So, but that's not a game situation because you never walk in alone and take a shot unless a breakaway sure. once, you, whatever. So now all of a sudden I give you a second player to play with. Okay, now Aaron, you have you two guys are going to attack this guy two on one. Okay, now you have a bit of an idea of. Does this guy know how to create space? Does he pass the puck at the right moment? So all of a sudden, by adding a second player, you have to have some more reads into it. You can't just go shoot the puck because yeah. you're not using your partner. You're not even looking at him. So by having a second player, now you can take a look. And, and most guys in junior can do two-on-ones. They're fine. Now I make it a three-on-one, which would be, oh, so difficult for the defenseman. It's easier. Because the three players don't know how to use each other. It's ironic. Okay, guys, we're doing three-on-ones. The defenseman almost says, thank you. It's easier to play against the three than it was two. Because the three guys don't know how to work with each other to create space. 
Nobody goes to the net, and there's no net drive. They all hang back to get the shots like an umbrella, and the guy just stays in the middle. So you're thinking. Man, it just as you like, I'm just thinking like as you're talking, like the one thing that I'm going to focus and change dramatically in in my practices coming out of this conversation is just starting drills where players have to have to go retrieve the puck. Absolutely. Versus starting with it, yeah. Because you don't, you never start in the game with the puck on your stick, not even on yeah. a face off. No, I mean, so it's, it's, it's it sounds like the most ignorant thing to say, but I just think of how many times like we always start drills with players having the puck for the most part. Yeah, go get it. Yeah. How is it when you? I mean, obviously, you I mean you're going in and spending a, a finite amount of time with these teams. Um, how much? How quickly can you maybe? And I don't know if you're making the difference necessarily with the players as much as the coach who then is going to maybe change how they approach practice or how they approach teaching. But, um, you know, you, you talk about, say, a player that's at the U18 or U20 level. Um, how quickly can a change in practice structure show up in the decision making or how they're processing the game in, in real time? I, I think it happens immediately when you start doing races. And, you know, both Canada, you know, Hockey Canada and USA Hockey have age limits on, on, on what they call checking. Yeah. Okay. So we're not going to be able to change that as coaches. You know, they have doctors who've gone into this and brain, you know, brain structure and, and, and whatever. So, but the actual game itself is physical, physical. All right. So every time you have a race, there's physicality. So if I can teach players in practice right away how to win a race and that is if if you have the puck you know in a certain spot like say the puck is right here where this glass is if i let you get to the glass the same time as me you have as much chance to win that puck as as i have because we both have a chance to get there at the same moment but if i step in front of you immediately or somewhere in the race i get in front of you put you on my back now I've got a greater percentage to win that puck, correct? Because you have to go around me to get it. My body is protecting it. So we teach right away in, in races, you know, take away that space as soon as you can and put the player on your back. And then when you feel the player on your back, if you're on my right side, I go left. If you're on my left shoulder, I go right, if that makes sense yeah. to you. So totally now right. all of a sudden I'm doing game situations which happen 12 times a shift. And I'm learning how to either win the race or if I'm the second guy, you know, not being able to get in front of, how do I defend it to prevent you from, you know, getting away from me? Should, should we be, when, you know, going back to the fundamentals is what you just described there, that, that process of players understanding that, Hey, they, you know, a, they got to get in. Um, it's not just a race. It's, it's gaining leverage in the race yes. and then being able to identify what shoulder, um, the opposing players on and understanding that you want to try and um, turn away from that pressure. Should, should that be defined as a fundamental in hockey? Cause I don't think that it probably is for most people. It should be done over and over again because it's happening consistently every shift. Yeah. And ironically, you know, I'm a left-hand shot. So a lot of times if I just go get a puck say, okay, guys, we're going to do retrievals, go get a puck and we're going to make a quick pass out of this. Well, if I go to my backhand, all right, so I'm going to my backhand side, most yeah. players, they wait until my body comes all the way around to them on my forehand to pass the puck back, all right, because they want to yeah. make a forehand pass. But yeah. look at the time I've wasted from here, where the backhand pass can make it immediately, to the time to go all the way around to get the puck in position, and the opposition is going to eat me up there. So, so the, and I, you know, that's a great point because I – I think so many um, co and I'm putting my hand up here is this would have been something that, you know, I would have emphasized is that, you know, particularly in the defensive zone, make plays on your forehand because it's a sure play. But if you have you know, time, I mean, it goes back to how you think about practice is like, no, like you got to develop the backhand because that's just, it's the better and more efficient play, but you got to practice to your point. You got to practice that. You can't just show well, it on video. In essence, you know, you know, nobody wants to use the backhand side of their stick now, maybe because the the curve or the patterns, you know, whatever we have. But because you don't use your back, you know, back backhand side of your stick, 
you're playing 50% of your ability. Yeah. And guys who make good backhand passes are going to move up the food chain quicker because in those moments when they have to use it, they can. In the moment that you should have used it, you don't because you go to your forehand. So I want to go back to earlier in your career when you went to, I mean, and you, you touched on it again earlier where you talked about like in, in North America, Canada, and the U S we produce players on, on volume. And that's, and I don't want to suggest that there's not a ton of great coaches. Oh, for sure. There part of, there's, there's, there's a ton, but when you went to Europe and, and particularly early on in your career, when you go to Sweden, what did you observe there that maybe signaled to you that, Hey, this might, um, be the reason where statistically, I mean, they're producing players and it is what it is at, at a, at a much more efficient rate than we are in North America. You know, again, particularly Sweden, Finland and, uh, and Czechia or Czechoslovakia. Yeah. Um, I, I think they're set up a little differently in their, in their organization, their hockey organizations. Well, yeah. If you understand, I mean, you have a top team, you know, give me any name you want to have, like Froland or whatever. You have a top team in the Swedish league, or if you have, yeah. you know, uh, Joker or whatever else in this Finnish league, and then you have all your teams underneath them. So the Vancouver Canucks, Vancouver Canucks, where you are, would have their top team. They'd have a junior team, right? And then they have a U18, U16, U4, all the way down to learn to skate, all under the Vancouver umbrella. Yeah. And the, the difference probably... I think that makes them a little bit more successful in developing is that the U8 coach understands what the U10 coach is teaching. The U10 coach understands what the U8 coach is teaching. So the teaching progression is understood all the way up so that when you take a player from the, the next, the lower level, who's moved up age wise, you know what he's done. You know, what his fundamentals are because you practice the same way. And sometimes you have the same terminology. You know, so the players aren't saying, what that word mean? You know, what do you mean? What's, what's that mean? You know, second quick. What's this mean of, you know, hunt or fort? You know, so they have the same terminology. So it's a little bit easier for each coach to communicate. And the players, as they move up, they have, this has been done at the U8 level, this fundamentals. This fundamentals at 10 has been done. This fundamentals at 12 has been done. This fundamentals at 14 has been done. So they have a little bit easier handle on it. And don't forget both... You know, USA, USA Hockey and Hockey Canada, we have a large population in a large country to try to control or work at. You know, they're much smaller, 8 million, 10 million, whatever it's going to be. So I think it's a little bit more difficult for us to have a handle on this. But if you were doing the North Shore Vancouver um, Hockey Organization, yeah. I would hope that you'd have the same fundamentals being, you know, built up all the way from eight to 10 to 12 to 14 to 16 and the same terminology all the way up. So the players have an easier transition going from one year to the next to the coach, to the coach. Yeah. You know, we do this um, series called um, hockey factories. So every year we, uh, Matt Dumichel, the author does an amazing job with it, but he profiles five different organization, each from a different country. So we've done for Lunda, Jokerit, Aldermanheim, Shaddix, just did Notre Dame. Um, it goes on. But, you know, the one thing that we've observed in all those organizations, just not the, Euro the European ones, is that all the coaches are riding the same bike. And they're cool with that. Like they don't, and I, and I think that, you know, you talk about, you know, certainly my experience is that, there was almost a point where it was like coaches, like, even if I, and I, and again, I'm generalizing here, but it was almost like, even if I subscribe to what you're saying, I still rather do it my way because then it's my way. And if things work out, I get the credit for it versus, um, organization you know, wise. the organization. Yeah. And I, I think, and again, I think, I know we've, we've touched on this in a earlier conversation, but you know, when we went to Finland last year, um, and, and we, we sponsor the, IHF coaching symposium at the world championships, you know, the one thing that stood out to me um, was the amount of Finnish coaches, regardless if they had ever coached a player in their younger years that went on to play on the national team, they all felt a part of it. Yeah. Like they felt included. They were so proud of um, just the fact that they got to be a part of that organization. And that just struck me as something that we maybe don't experience over here. 
No, I'm not sure because it's the director's responsibility to make sure everybody's, you know, has the same yeah. thought process or at least to try to move up. Or, I mean, the coaches have to buy into it and you have coaches of all different levels as well, which, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of guys, thank God they're giving back to the game who played pro. It's, it's tremendous yeah. to have a pro guy give back to the game. And then yeah. you have a college, a college, a college player who's giving back to the game. And then you had somebody who played amateur giving back to the game. And then you have a father who can just barely skate giving back to the game. So you have a lot of different dimensions sure. of, of coaches. And the only thing I noticed that I would, you know, share with all your, your listeners is that, you know, a coach is a coach and, you know, I commend you for playing pro and I commend you for playing uh, college and I commend you for stepping on the ice, give your time in essence. Yeah. And all those guys should demand from their players discipline and, you know, an effort, because if you don't have a disciplined environment, you can't you can't succeed and produce players. It's just, it's just you need discipline. And you need competitiveness in your practice. You know, I can give you an analogy of, of why certain teams do well in football, in, in college football. Well, they have one hundred and ten players on a, on a scholarship. All right. So you take two teams which probably recruit as well as anybody in North America. You take Georgia and Alabama. Yeah. All right. So if you're on the third level team, if you're in third string, you're what they call the scout team, which means you are playing the opposition all week long in practice. So Georgia and Alabama, they're playing against a scout team that's as good as the opponent they're going to play on Saturday. Yeah. So when they play the game on Saturday, they're I've already played guys better than you guys. You know what I'm saying? Like, of course they're going to be good. And if you go to top end programs, you know, you say Shattuck or NDP or, or some pro programs that have, a, you know, a, a very high identity of, of the competitiveness and intensity in practice is going to help you become a better player. Yeah. So with that being said, I mean, you talk about, you know, the European, the, the alignment amongst coaches. Yes. And, you know, that's sort of an organizational framework. You talk about the discipline um, that a, a coach creates within their program. Those two things are free. Yeah. You know, th those, those are, you know, th those are actionable by, by anyone listening to this. Um, I don't want to ask why that maybe gets, gets missed, but is, is it just maybe a matter of, of stressing that more? And I, and part of the reason I bring this up is, you know, just the work we do at the coaches site, then like the overwhelming number one um, inquiry that we receive is for drills. Coaches just want drills. And I mean, sometimes I'm like, man, like the, if you don't have alignment and discipline, the drill really doesn't matter. Like, Correct. you know, that you need those, those two things are the, those have to be the foundation of your program or how you approach your role as a coach versus just having a binder full of drills. And, and when I go out and work with the younger teams now, I find that coaches will ask me, you know, how do we raise the level of compete? You know, you know, we have to get a higher intensity. What can we do? Well, I think if you reinforce um, whatever drill you're doing with you know, with compete and then you reward compete, you know, so everybody knows somebody won. I mean, all this idea of everybody wins a trophy, you know, and, and that's great for sitting in the schoolhouse, you know, but we're talking about we're in sports now. You chose to go in sports. So yeah. we have to help the compete and you have to help reinforce it. You know, and it's not just don't just give the guy who scored the goal all the high fives. What about the guy that blocked the shot or the guy that paid the price of getting the puck out or the guy who, you know, takes a hit to make a play? I mean, that's all part of winning. So we have to reinforce the grunt work as yeah. much as we reinforce the goal. How, how do you do that? Is that just as simple in the post game locker room speech to acknowledge people? Is that in video? Is that done in practice? How do you how do coaches make sure I, I they do that? I think number one, I would, I would reinforce practice. You have a practice player of the week. Cause if we practice, start raising yeah. the level, you know what I'm saying? A practice player of the week and you can have his name on the board or, you know, put up in the locker room, whatever you can do. But, you, and then if you have small ice game, whatever games you have, the winning team goes on the board, you know, right up, you know, these three guys won this and they take a look at Tuesday, who won Tuesday, who won Wednesday. So, and then we have to reinforce all that hard work. That's not on YouTube you know, of the backhand pass or the between the legs, you know, 
we have to reinforce the stuff that really is the main part of the game. And, you know, in, in football, you take a look at these, I don't want to keep going back to college football, but they, they have, you know, either. a so I like college football. Helmet. Okay. But you have something on your helmet to show that you've done something well, and they have it usually yeah. one day a week with a reward, all the guys. Well, some hockey teams have it on their helmets too now. So if you wanted to reinforce, you know, practice player of the week, you could have something on a, on his helmet, you know, whatever you want to designate with, or, or you, we just have to reinforce practice because without it, you know, you, you're not going to get better. Yeah. Um, yeah, man, I, I think that that's just a great piece of advice. And again, it's actionable. Um, it, it's free, but just to have that sort of reward system and, um, you know, Barry, you, you, you talk about football. I, I found this really interesting. You were a three-sport athlete uh, at Elmira College. You played hockey. You were the captain your season, your senior season. You played lacrosse and you played football. But it, it would appear that football was, I don't know if it was your favorite sport, but it was perhaps the one that you uh, most excelled at. I know you played semi-professionally after you, you left college. But I didn't know this name until the last 24 hours, Jim Butterfield, your, your football coach at, at Elmira, who I did some research well, on. I'm like, yeah, what a career. Ithaca, Ithaca. Ithaca, prop, I, I apologize. Yeah, but Jim Butterfield um, was, yeah, he was an amazing coach and he was well regarded in the college ranks, you know. And, you know, I was lucky to play, play for him um, for three years because back when I went to college, all freshmen had to play freshmen, you know, and then. Got it. Yeah, and it changed over there. What, 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 you know, what lessons you may have learned from Jim might exist in your coaching DNA today? Fundamentals, really fundamentals, and over and over again. Um, and then I think he really reinforced effort. You know, we had a practice guy, a practice player of the week, a practice player of the month, and a practice player of the season. You know what I'm saying? So. Wow! Really? Oh yeah. So we, we had, you know, some identification of, of those guys who, who gave it all. Um, when you play, um, you know, the level of football we played, it was at that time it was Division Two, It was Division One. You know, we had smaller athletes because genetically these guys weren't as big as the guys that played Division sure. One. You might not be quite as fast or, or skilled, but it doesn't mean they didn't give their all. You know what I'm saying? The effort was still there. Just the possibly the ability to perform wasn't as great as a, a guy from the SEC. So it was a fun environment and um, it was a great environment to actually work with and, and work under. And that's why as I go out and work with the youth youth teams today, um, you know, what we're missing Aaron. we're missing those neighborhood coaches, you know, that got us going, you know, we don't oh, have hundred percent. Yeah. You know, we don't remember the neighborhood coaches who you just love to go out and play in the street because someone's was running practice, running drills or had, on the field, you know, he's got a baseball thing going on. So I think the kids are missing that today. And if we don't reinforce, you know, the intensity and effort and, and compete, who is? It sure is not going to be in the classroom. Yeah. Is that, you know, and I, and I just think, and I mean, part of this is close to home. And as, as I mentioned, I've got a, I've got a little guy and, you know, we'll have, yeah, we had, you know, road hockey going on in the neighborhood and, you know, you've got it's great because there's five year olds playing against eight years old and they get knocked down and they got to get back sure. up and you figure out who's, you know, who's competitive. But is there is there something to be said for maybe creating the environment, but then stepping back and just observing and not because I, I think that's almost how we define coaching days. You got to just you got to be you got to be involved in every little piece and kids, as you said, miss out on that opportunity just to play and you know, recover from a bloody nose or, you know, somebody takes a penalty and there's no referee to call it. So they got to figure it out on their own or they got to, you know, they can make a backhand pass and nobody's going to, coach isn't going to bark at them for not making the safe play. I just think if, if you could have once again, you know, a backyard play, um, I mean, the neighborhood, you grew up in neighborhood. We all grew up in neighborhoods, you know, we all did. And we all had to play with somebody because you couldn't go so far. So you had to learn how to, you know, make do, but, I just find for hockey practices, yeah. um, when I go on the ice with a different group, I can tell whether they've been disciplined or not based upon when you blow the whistle, how fast they come to you and versus some guy out there shooting the puck still against the wall. Or if you're doing a drill and you turn around and three guys are whacking each other with the stick, you know, and, and playing shinny behind you. 
Yeah. I mean, so what kind of teaching environment do you want to have? I mean, the, the problem we have with hockey today, it's the cost. The, yeah, cost, of, yeah. the cost of sticks, the cost of skates, it's the cost of, you know, so you have a short time to make something happen. And I'm a big believer in, in making sure that time is used, you know, correctly, really. I mean, as best you can, as best you can. So we, we've covered a lot of ground today. Yeah. And I, my spidey sense tells me that I'm going to, you're going to have a lot of people reaching out to you. I'm going to have a lot of people reaching out to me to get a hold of you yeah. to get Barry Smith to come out to their practice. Um, you know, because we're not able to clone you and we're not be able to realize that for everybody, what might be, you know, when you go and work with a team or work with a coach, could you sort of summarize maybe the, the key, I don't know if it's, three things, five things, but the key things you say, like, I want every coach to take these things away, regardless of what, you know, what level they're at. Um, I would say to you, Aaron, if you're doing a shooting drill, okay, why would you have a shooting drill where a player has only clean ice ahead of him without making a deke, a move, read a stick, or go through somebody to get yeah. that shot? because it never happens in the game. So let's replicate it. So the first shooter starts the, pra- shoots, starts, starts the drill. He goes and shoots, and he comes back up, and he attacks the next shooter. He can attack him 50%, you know what I'm saying? He can attack him only by putting his stick on one side or the other, so you have to read it. But at least I have to go buy somebody before I release the puck. You know, And then I have to go through something that moves. Like pylons are good for younger kids to start, You know, the, yeah. the younger ages. But in essence, we need something that moves because a pylon doesn't stick check you. It doesn't move forward or backwards. So once you go around it once or twice, I can do it with my eyes closed. But we have to have more read and react on our practices. So definitely shooting. If, and, and then I would say you're shooting with for a purpose. If I go on the ice with a junior team and hear all the guys hitting the glass, I'm thinking they weren't coached. The hell, why would I want my, all my guys shooting the puck over the net for? I don't get a rebound. You know, the puck's going out of the zone. It's an easy breakout. It's the worst thing you can do. Yeah. And they couldn't hit the top corner anyways. So, guys, can we shoot the puck on the ice? No, they can't shoot it on the ice. They don't know how to shoot it on the ice. They don't know how to shoot the puck hard on the ice. Yeah. So, I mean, by having a purpose and making sure they do that purpose, the guys love it. They want discipline. They really do. You know, I would have – I'd have a relay race – or races with the pros and I got guys making millions of bucks and they're fighting over each other. Cause somebody has got his, you know, one foot over the line and he's cheating, you know, like guys. Yeah. Oh no, no coach. He's looking, he's cheating. Look, 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 get back, get back, get back, get back. You know, so, cause they're competitive, they compete, they know that. So let's add that compete to practice and then let's make sure there's, you know, hopefully with assistant coaches, you can have more than one station going. So you can do more things if, if you're lucky enough to have more than one coach or two coaches. So, yeah, but it's, it's well, hard. Well, no, I was just going to say, I love it. There's, there's a great article that I read when you went out, I believe it was earlier this season with uh, Cedar Rapids in the USHL. And it just talks about how like the, the first drill you did, um, you communicated that, you know, there, there was going to be a winner and a loser and the loser team had to do pushups. I think some, for, for whatever reason, and I, and I get that, you know, there's been a real effort to remove things like bag skates from our game and practice. And that's not a good use of time because ice time is expensive and it's limited. Right. But I think sometimes maybe we've gone too far to say that, you know, you know, pushups aren't necessarily a bad thing either. If they're reinforcing a good lesson that, you know, frankly, is probably going to extend well beyond the ice and, and, and what a, a young app, you know, young person just does athletically. Right. I mean, when I coached in Russia, I noticed the youth hockey guys were doing somersaults. So the losers had to, you know, had to do somersaults on the ice or, or do the uh, army That's crawl. Great. That's or, cool. You know, the army crawl on the ice. So, you know, so it doesn't matter. Just some, yeah. So whatever the motivation is to try to get a winner or loser and, and try to instill that compete because we are in a game of competition. Yeah. And just compete for a puck all over the ice continuously. So, you know, you play football, you've clearly – brought in some of the lessons uh, that you learned in football into your, into your you know, um, your coaching pedigree. Just through your, your travels, Barry, um, I mean, man, you've played in some 
world-class sports city. I imagine that you've had an opportunity to cross path with a whole cross section of people, be it in or outside of sports, but you know, any other coaches or experiences that you would look back on and say, gosh, I, I really learned some, some key stuff from that person or from, from having been able to be exposed to that situation. Um, I, I think as, if, as hockey coaches, we can look at some sports, which are similar. I mean, so in essence, you can look at soccer. Yeah. which has a lot of the triangulation, you know, in support and also take away time and space. Basketball, you know, has some give and go situations to it. And it's sort of a five on five type game, you know, man on man switch, that type of thing. Lacrosse is an excellent game as well. You know, that has a lot of the same components. Um, you know, baseball is hitting the fat, you know, hitting the ball, which is a little bit different. So, um, and then football was just pretty much, you know, your ability to, you compete every play in football, you know, based upon if you're a lineman yeah. or, or a defensive back or whatever. And I, I really love playing football, but when I tried to coach it, I had to, my graduate year, I was a, a graduate student and I had to help coach the varsity as part of your deal. I didn't like the idea of playing one game a week. You know, I, I wanted to yeah. play more games. So yeah. in hockey, we have a chance to play more than one game a week. It's a lot better for a coach. You don't wear that all week long, you know? Yeah. I lost that one. You're pissed off from Sunday to Monday, you know, to the next Friday. Um, w- w- one experience that we we haven't touched on was was your time in Phoenix with the Coyotes and, and coaching alongside uh, Wayne Gretzky. And I, I know that, you know, I, I think, you know, when Wayne, Wayne was hired and certainly uh, after he left, and I mean, I – Goes without saying that that whole circumstances around the the Coyotes as an organization, which I think a lot of them exist today, just weren't favorable to creating a, a sustainably competitive team. But you know, the, the narrative seemed to be that oh, like you know, Wayne was so, you know, he was such a savant when it came to playing the game that there's you know it would be impossible for him to translate that or for him to maybe relate to the players he was coaching. However, I find it interesting that it seems that you know in recent years, players that were a part of those teams have come out and said, well, actually, you know, Wayne was a really good coach and, and, and was a good teacher. And I'd just be, I'd be curious to know, like, in your opinion, what made or what would have made Wayne a, a great coach if he had have continued along that path? Um, maybe better assistance. <laughs> so I could have been a better assistant. No, um, I think Wayne, first of all, for a superstar, and an athlete at that level, that stratosphere, he was the most humble human being I've ever met. I mean, and I'm not really just saying not. that. He really was. And he was being tugged in a lot of different directions continuously. So his time management was really hard. And, you know, he was even doing commercials sometimes or whatever else. And so that was difficult. And uh, Rick Tockett was a, a, a very good assistant, too, at that time. I think Rick Bonus was there the first year. And trying to get synergy between all of us uh, wasn't easy, you know, because we hadn't worked together previously. Yeah. So, and it was a team that didn't have roles. You know, it was a locker room of just assortment of players. So you had assortment of players in that room without really high definition of, you know, first line, second line, third line, fourth line, role playing. It was just a bunch of guys. And it was hard to get that group to, to, to play at the level you wanted to win with. So it wasn't an environment, I would say to you, the, it wasn't an environment that was easy to win with. And, Fair. Fair. and he, was, he was a very patient guy. Emotionally, he's, he's really stable with a lot of highs and lows. And, you know, I was probably more of a pain in the ass as a coach than me trying, trying to do all the extra stuff, kicking ass. And it, it just, we didn't have a, a synergy of, of working together that was going to make it work. Sure. But Wayne... Wayne was all, you know, he was all in for when he was in, but he couldn't be all in all the time because of all his constraints. Yeah. So his, you know, his reading the game, he's one of those superstars. He's a, you know, a Mario Lemieux type guy. I mean, who they see the game totally different than you and I. They yeah. can't even explain it to us. And it's like, yeah. why'd, you, why'd you make that play? <laughs> because the only play I could see, you know, like, when yeah. why did I make that play? Because I didn't know to make another play. Well, there was two other plays you had. If you would, have, you know, did just, you know, so that's the hardship for those guys is teaching somebody like us who, wow. 
Yeah. No, that makes total sense. And, and, and Barry, before we let you go, you're going to be presenting this year at TCS Live, which we're extremely excited about. Right. Um, are you able to provide perhaps a bit of a, a, a teaser as to what you're going to be uh, discussing with our audience there? Yeah, I think what I'm going to do is I, I know your coaches want to have some drills, so I'm going to give them ideas to do on the ice. That's going to help the, the read and react situations and try to improve their practice to make it more game replication like. Um, but the other thing I think that we can both do is if we can give coaches concepts so they understand what a concept is, they can build their own drills. You know what I'm saying? As long as they understand what they want to accomplish. So a drill alone is useless because all it is, you go here, you go there. But what are you trying to accomplish? You know, what is the main point you want to do? What are you reinforcing? So just to put lines on a paper, you know, it's 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 like, okay, trace, you know, one of those trace games you, you go around. But really, everything has a purpose and a reason why you're doing something. Even small ice games, you know, even small ice games should have purpose and a winner and loser, really, you know, to get that up. And, you know, I'll, I'll definitely help out if any of your any of your people reach out to you. You know, you can give them my email because, you know, my job now in, at the time of my career is I want to give back to coaches as much as much as we can. And that's what you're doing as well. No, oh, love it. Love it. Well, we're, we're certainly excited to uh, uh, connect with you and our audience in, in Ann Arbor in June. And, and Barry, man, I, I'll tell you what, um, I, I feel incredibly fortunate that I get to do this and, and you know, sit down with folks like yourself and reflect on their career. But I mean, man, oh, man, I mean, you've had a, a remarkable career. And I, and I feel like there was still so much that we, we, we didn't touch on, but really appreciate taking time to share a bit about you know, from your experience and, and, and again, being so forthcoming with, um, well, I was worried about going this long. So I'll be honest with you. I thought we we're going to have fluff for the next, you know, so thanks for, for bringing me along. Cause I wasn't quite sure how we we're going to run this program. Thank you. No, no, this is great. And, uh, again, we look forward to seeing Ann Arbor and, uh, all the best in your travels until then. I appreciate it. I'll be in touch. Thanks, Aaron.